Chapter Five of A Witch Shall Be Born by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: The Voice from the Crystal. In a chamber in a tower near the city wall, a group of men listened attentively to the words of one of their number. They were young men, but hard and sinewy with a bearing that comes only to men rendered desperate by adversity. They were clad in mail shirts and worn leather, swords hung at their girdles. I knew that Conan spoke the truth when he said it was not Taramis, the leader exclaimed. For months I have haunted the outskirts of the palace, playing the part of a deaf beggar. At last I learned what I had believed that our queen was a prisoner in the dungeons that adjoined the palace. I watched my opportunity and captured a Shemitish jailer, knocked him senseless as he left the courtyard late one night, dragged him into a cellar nearby, and questioned him. Before he died, he told me what I have just told you, and what we have suspected all along that the woman ruling Khauran is a witch. Salome. Taramus, he said, is imprisoned in the lowest dungeon. This invasion of the Zwagirs gives us the opportunity we sought. What Conan means to do, I cannot say. Perhaps he merely wishes vengeance on Constantius. Perhaps he intends sacking the city and destroying it. He is a barbarian, and no one can understand their minds. But this is what we must do. Rescue Taramis while the battle rages. Constantius will march out into the plain to give battle. Even now his men are mounting. He will do this because there is not sufficient food in the city to stand the siege. Conan burst out of the desert so suddenly that there was no time to bring in supplies, and the Cimmerian is equipped for a siege. Scouts have reported that the Zoagirs have siege engines, built undoubtedly according to the instructions of Conan, who learned all the arts of war among the western nations. Constantius does not desire a long siege, so he will march with his warriors into the plain, where he expects to scatter Conan's forces at one stroke. He will leave only a few hundred men in the city, and they will be on the walls and in the towers commanding the gates. The prison will be left all but unguarded. When we have freed Taramis, our next actions will depend upon circumstances. If Conan wins, we must show Taramis to the people and bid them rise. They will. Oh, they will. With their bare hands they are enough to overpower the Shemites left in the city and close the gates against both the mercenaries and the nomads. Neither must get within the walls. Then we will parley with Conan. He was always loyal to Taramis. If he knows the truth and she appeals to him, I believe he will spare the city. If, which is more probable, Constantius prevails and Conan is routed, we must steal out of the city with the queen and seek safety in flight. Is all this clear? They replied with one voice. Then let us loosen our blades and our scabbards, commend our souls to Ishtar, and start for the prison, for the mercenaries are already marching through the southern gate. This was true. The dawn light glinted on peaked helmets, pouring in a steady stream through the broad arch, on the bright housings of the chargers. This would be a battle of horsemen, such as is possible only in the lands of the east. The riders flowed through the gates like a river of steel, somber figures in black and silver mail, with their curled beards and hooked noses, and their inexorable eyes in which glimmered the fatality of their race, the utter lack of doubt or of mercy. The streets and the walls were lined with throngs of people who watched silently these warriors of an alien race riding forth to defend their native city. There was no sound. Dully, expressionless, they watched. Those gaunt people in shabby garments, their caps in their hands. 
In a tower that overlooked the broad street that led to the southern gate, Salome lolled on a velvet couch, cynically watching Constantius as he settled his broad sword-belt about his lean hips and drew on his gauntlets. They were alone in the chamber. Outside, the rhythmical clink of harness and shuffle of horses' hooves welled up through the gold-barred casements. Before nightfall, quoth Constantius, giving a twirl to his thin moustache, you'll have some captives to feed to your temple devil. Does it not grow weary of soft city-bred flesh? Perhaps it would relish the harder thews of a desert man. Take care you do not fall prey to a fiercer beast than Thog, warned the girl. Do not forget who it is that leads these desert animals. I am not likely to forget, he answered. That is one reason why I am advancing to meet him. The dog has fought in the west and knows the art of siege. My scouts had some trouble in approaching his columns, for his outriders have eyes like hawks, but they did get close enough to see the engines he is dragging on ox-cart wheels drawn by camels. Catapults, rams, ballistas, mangonels by Ishtar. He must have had ten thousand men working day and night for a month. Where he got the material for their construction is more than I can understand. Perhaps he has a treaty with the Turanians and gets supplies from them. Anyway, they won't do him any good. I fought these desert wolves before, an exchange of arrows for a while, in which the armor of my warriors protects them, then a charge, and my squadrons sweep through the loose swarms of the nomads, wheel and sweep back through, scattering them to the four winds. I'll ride back through the south gate before sunset, with hundreds of naked captives staggering at my horse's tail. We'll hold a fete tonight in the great square. My soldiers delight in flaying their enemies alive. We will have a wholesale skinning and make these weak-kneed townsfolk watch. As for Conan, it will afford me intense pleasure, if we take him alive, to impale him on the palace steps. Skin as many as you like, answered Salome indifferently. I would like a dress made of human hide, but at least a hundred captives you must give to me, for the altar and for Thog. It shall be done, answered Constantius, with his gauntleted hand brushing back the thin hair from his high bald forehead, burned dark by the sun. For victory? And the fair honor of Taramis, he said sardonically, and taking his visored helmet under his arm, he lifted a hand in salute and strode clanking from the chamber. His voice drifted back, harshly lifted in orders to his officers. Salome leaned back on the couch, yawned, stretched herself like a great supple cat, and called, Zong! A cat-footed priest, with features like yellowed parchment stretched over a skull, entered noiselessly. Salome turned to an ivory pedestal on which stood two crystal globes, and, taking from it the smaller, she handed the glistening sphere to the priest. "'Ride with Constantius,' she said. "'Give me the news of the battle. Go.' The skull-faced man bowed low, and, hiding the globe under his dark mantle, hurried from the chamber. Outside in the city there was no sound except the clank of hoofs and, after a while, the clank of a closing gate. Salome mounted a wide marble stair that led to the flat, canopied, marble, battlemented roof. She was above all other buildings in the city. The streets were deserted. The great square in front of the palace was empty. In normal times folk shunned the grim temple which rose on the opposite side of that square, but now the town looked like a dead city. Only on the southern wall and the roofs that overlooked it was there any sign of life. 
There the people massed thickly. They made no demonstration, did not know whether to hope for the victory or defeat of Constantius. Victory meant further misery under his intolerable rule. Defeat probably meant the sack of the city and red massacre. No word had come from Conan. They did not know what to expect at his hands. They remembered that he was a barbarian. The squadrons of the mercenaries were moving out into the plain. In the distance, just this side of the river, other dark masses were moving, barely recognizable as men on horses. Objects dotted the farther bank. Conan had not brought his siege engines across the river, apparently fearing an attack in the midst of the crossing, but he had crossed with his full force of horsemen. The sun rose and struck glints of fire from the dark multitudes. The squadrons from the city broke into a gallop. A deep roar reached the ears of the people on the wall. The rolling masses merged, intermingled. At that distance it was a tangled confusion in which no details stood out. Charge and countercharge were not to be identified. Clouds of dust rose from the plains under the stamping hoofs, veiling the action. Through these swirling clouds masses of riders loomed, appearing and disappearing, and spears flashed. Salome shrugged her shoulders and descended the stair. The palace lay silent. All the slaves were on the wall, gazing vainly southward with the citizens. She entered the chamber where she had talked with Constantius, and approached the pedestal, noting that the crystal globe was clouded, shot with bloody streaks of crimson. She bent over the ball, swearing under her breath. Zong, she called. Zong. Mists swirled in the sphere, resolving themselves into billowing dust clouds, through which black figures rushed unrecognizably. Steel glinted like lightning in the murk. Then the face of Zong leaped into startling distinctness. It was as if the wide eyes gazed up at Salome. Blood trickled from a gash in the skull-like head. The skin was gray with sweat-runneled dust. The lips parted, writhing. To other ears than Salome's, it would have seemed that the face in the crystal contorted silently but sound to her came as plainly from those ashen lips as if the priest had been in the same room with her, instead of miles away shouting into the smaller crystal. Only the gods of darkness knew what unseen magic filaments linked together those shimmering spheres. "'Salome!' shrieked the bloody head. "'Salome!' "'I hear,' she cried. "'Speak. How goes the battle?' Doom is upon us, screamed the skull-like apparition. Koran is lost. Ay, my horse is down, and I cannot win clear. Men are falling around me. They are dying like flies in their silvered mail. Stop yammering and tell me what happened, she cried harshly. We rode at the desert dogs, and they came on to meet us, yowled the priest. Arrows flew in clouds between the hosts, and the nomads wavered. Constantius ordered the charge. In even ranks we thundered upon them. Then uh, the masses of their horde opened to right and left, and through the cleft rushed three thousand Hyborian horsemen, whose presence we had not even suspected. Men of Koran, mad with hate! Big men in full armor on massive horses. In a solid wedge of steel they smote us like a thunderbolt. They split our ranks asunder before we knew what was upon us, and then the desert men swarmed on us from either flank. They have ripped our ranks apart, broken and scattered us. It is a trick of that devil, Conan. The siege engines are false. Mere frames of palm trunks and painted silk that fooled our scouts who saw them from afar. A trick to draw us out to our doom. Our warriors flee. 
Kumbani Gosh is down. Conan slew him. I do not see, Constantius. The Karani rage through our milling masses like blood-mad lions, and the desert men feather us with arrows. I— There was a flicker as of lightning or trenchant steel, a burst of bright blood. Then abruptly the image vanished, like a bursting bubble, and Salome was staring into an empty crystal ball that mirrored only her own furious features. She stood perfectly still for a few moments, erect and staring into space. Then she clapped her hands, and another skull-like priest entered, as silent and immobile as the first. Constantius is beaten, she said swiftly. We are doomed. Conan will be crashing at our gates within the hour. If he catches me, I have no illusions as to what I can expect. But first, I am going to make sure that my cursed sister never ascends the throne again. Follow me. Come what may, we shall give Thog a feast. As she descended the stairs and galleries of the palace, she heard a faint, rising echo from the distant walls. The people there had begun to realize that the battle was going against Constantius. Through the dust clouds, masses of horsemen were visible, racing toward the city. Palace and prison were connected by a long, closed gallery, whose vaulted roof rose on gloomy arches. Hurrying along this, the false queen and her slave passed through a heavy door at the other end that let them into the dim recesses of the prison. They had emerged into a wide arched corridor at a point near where a stone stair descended into the darkness. Salome recoiled suddenly, swearing. In the gloom of the hall lay a motionless form, a Shemitish jailer. His short beard tilted toward the roof as his head hung on a half-severed neck. As panting voices from below reached the girl's ears, she shrank back into the black shadow of an arch, pushing the priest behind her, her hand groping in her girdle. End of chapter 5